Good morning, and welcome to Central Presbyterian Church's online worship service for this Sunday, March 7th, 2021. I'm your lay reader, Zach Cosner. I invite you to download the bulletin for today's service, which can be found in the link in the description underneath this video on Facebook and on YouTube, or you can head to our website, www.centralprespb.com, click on the publications link, scroll down until you see today's date, and once you click on that, you'll download the PDF uh, of the order of worship and bulletin for today's service. Uh, you can view that uh, uh, PDF on mobile devices and on tablets. Uh, you can also pause this video, go ahead and print it out, and then come on back, and we'll, uh, you can go ahead and follow along with today's service. Now that you've acquired the bulletin for today's service, I ask that you bring your attention to the announcements found on the last page of the bulletin. The One Great Hour of Sharing offering will be taken up on April 4th. This offering helps support the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance Fund, the, uh, the Presbyterian Hunger Program, and self-development of people. For more information on this offering, you can head to our website, www.centralprespb.com. Again, the session of CPC has continue, uh, decided to continue to stick with virtual services for the foreseeable future. Uh, please keep in contact with us via social media, where our username is centralprespb, or at our website for announcements about any special services or, and when we plan to resume in-person worship. I know that, um, again, I think I said this last week, but I know that uh, people are starting to get antsy. I know the numbers are improving and the, uh, the session is aware and uh, continues to be mindful of the, of the need and the, and the want to come back soon. Um, we are waiting for some, uh, a few things to, to check through and uh, we'll have, um, we'll probably have an announcement um, sometime in the, in the relatively near future, I'm hoping. Um, archives of our online services can be found on Facebook and on YouTube. Links to each are on our website, centralpresspb.com. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship the Lord. The God of heaven has made his home on earth. Christ dwells among us and is one with us. Highest in all creation, he lives among the least. He journeys with the rejected and welcomes the weary. Come now, all who thirst, and drink the water of life. Come now, all who hunger, and be filled with good things. Come now, all who seek, and be warmed by the fire of love. God is light. In God there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Christ while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light, as Christ, his, Christ himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Please join me in the prayer of confession found in your bulletin and uh, in unison and then silently. <clears throat> God of mercy, you sent Jesus Christ to seek and save the lost. We confess that we have strayed from you and turned aside from your way. We are misled by pride, for we see ourselves pure when we are stained, and great when we are small. We have failed in love, neglected justice, and ignored your truth. Have mercy, O God, and forgive our sin. Return us to paths of righteousness, through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Now silently. Amen. The good news in Christ is that when we face ourselves and God with the awareness of our need, we are given grace to grow and the courage to continue the journey. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Let's go ahead and turn it over to Reverend Tim Rees for this week's sermon, Whom Do We Think We're Fooling? Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Our first reading this morning comes from the 20th chapter of the book of Exodus, beginning with verse 1 and proceeding through verse 17. Let us listen <clears throat> for the word of the Lord. Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. 
you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. We turn now to our second reading from Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, beginning in chapter 1 at verse 18 and proceeding through verse 25. Again, let us listen for the word of the Lord. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. And finally, from the second chapter of the Gospel according to John, beginning with verse 13 and proceeding through verse 22. Again, let us listen for the word of the Lord. The Passover of the Jews was near. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 
46 years and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Open now our hearts and minds, O God, by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, so that as your word is proclaimed this day, we may hear with joy what it is you would have us hear, that hearing we might believe, and that believing we might live lives of richer and fuller service, glorifying you here on earth as you are glorified in heaven. Amen. Every once in a while, I will see a nature show on television which features animals or insects which have a way of blending in. In some cases, this is for their own protection from predators. In other cases, it is to help them ambush prey. But in both instances, blending in is part of what helps these particular animals or insects survive in the wild. But what is good in nature can be disastrous for the church. Blending in with the prevailing culture, presenting ourselves as respectable, not drawing any negative attention to ourselves, or avoiding anything which might be construed as controversial has long been a favorite survival technique of Christians. The trouble is that we are not called to blend in. In fact, the Greek word for church, ekklesia, means literally those who are called out of the world. So by definition, we are called to stand out, to stand apart, and to bear witness to the reign of God. Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard once remarked that if we remove from Christianity its ability to shock, then it is altogether destroyed. It becomes a tiny superficial thing capable neither of inflicting deep wounds nor of healing them. Or to put it another way, the moment that we seek to present ourselves as respectable is the moment we abandon the scandal of the cross. The moment we focus on our survival is the moment the church begins to die. And the moment that we try to blend in is the moment that we as a church lose our identity altogether. For everyone who is called to stand out, to stand apart, and to bear witness to the reign of God, it is the height of foolishness to cloak ourselves in anything but the wisdom of God. The trouble is that God's wisdom is what our sinful eyes so often regard as utter folly. For instance, it was not a young, strapping, healthy couple to whom God appeared and promised a new land and from whom would arise a great nation. Instead, it was an elderly and barren couple. Turn the pages of scripture and we find that their descendants, far from blending in, stand out in the crowd. Because in a world where nations and peoples divided their loyalties among any number of gods, this nation of their descendants pledged its loyalty to only one God. And our reading from Exodus this morning relates part of the establishment of that covenant. To everyone who view this as little more than a list of do's and don'ts, the Ten Commandments 
may seem like an oppressive yoke placed on the shoulders of God's people. But what we often overlook is the fact that these were God's gracious gift to God's beloved people. Given to the Israelites as or after they had been liberated from Egypt, God bound God's chosen people to God's self and to one another so that they might know true freedom and fullness of life. And when the people of Israel abandoned God's law or ignored God's law, God would raise up prophets to show them how they were only fooling themselves. Oftentimes these prophets would be commanded to exhibit foolish behavior to emphasize their point. For example, the prophet Hosea was commanded by God to take a prostitute as his wife in order to symbolize to Israel just how much they had prostituted themselves by bowing down to other gods. And I would imagine that were any Christian minister today called upon to do that, they'd face quite a bit of criticism and condemnation. Such foolish behavior was not just limited to the Hebrew scriptures, however. John the Baptist wore camel skin, ate only locusts and wild honey, and spent his time in the wilderness railing against the establishment and calling people to repent. And Jesus' apostles would surpass even John. We are told in the book of Acts that in their ecstasy after having received the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, their behavior led witnesses that day to think that they were drunk in public when it was only nine o'clock in the morning. And let us not forget the greatest fool the world has ever known. Jesus called people then and now to a very different way of life a way that runs completely counter to conventional wisdom. He commanded his followers to love their enemies and pray for those who persecute them. Conventional wisdom tells us to do anything but love such people. Our Lord said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. But conventional wisdom tells us that the meek will only be trampled by those scrambling to get to the top. Jesus said that any who would become his disciples must take up their cross and follow him. But conventional wisdom tells us to avoid pain and suffering at all costs. Yes, Jesus is the ultimate fool whose life and ministry, death and resurrection wreak havoc on a world that continues to call him and all who follow him foolish, irrational, impractical, or naive. Speaking of wreaking havoc, that is exactly what Jesus did in our reading from John's Gospel this morning. I find it interesting that while Matthew, Mark, and Luke all place this event of Jesus cleaning the temple, driving out the money changers, they put that in the last week of Jesus's life John's gospel reports this as taking place very early on in Jesus's earthly ministry. And whereas Matthew, Mark, and Luke tend to imply that Jesus's reason for driving the money changers out was that they were corrupt and cheating the people in their business dealings, John tells us that Jesus's real complaint is that they were there in the first place. Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. Our natural temptation is to want to protect those or to protest and to protect the animals and the money changers being there because this was, after all, an important service being provided. Animals were sold for sacrifices, and the money changers would take Roman currency with its images of Caesar 
and convert it into money without such images on it, thereby making it acceptable to be used in the temple to worship God. But what gets overlooked is the broader point that John's gospel is making. The temple had long been viewed as the dwelling place of God. But in Jesus Christ, the word of God incarnate, God was now dwelling in the midst of humanity. And as such, the sacrificial system of the temple was no longer necessary because Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The old way of doing things no longer applied. In fact, Jesus' act of cleaning out the temple was a statement which said that even the old and cherished practices had become an obstacle to the people's faith in, or the people's faith in God. Perhaps we would all do well to remember that the next time we are tempted to say something like, well, we've always done things a certain way before, or we've never done things that way before. We are only fooling ourselves if we think that our Lord would never drive out the sacred cows of tradition that we have erected over the years. And by the same token, we are only fooling ourselves if we think that our Lord would never accuse his church of making his father's house a marketplace if we were ever to stop proclaiming Christ crucified in favor of some message that was more appealing to the masses. And yet, the temptation to do just that is always before us. Regardless of the time or place in which we live, the prevailing culture always seems to ask, what kind of fool would believe in such nonsense? Why would anyone align themselves with one who was despised and rejected? Don't people know that by doing such things, they are opening themselves up for more ridicule? Don't they understand that Making such a commitment just doesn't make any sense. Why devote one's time and talents, treasures, and self to the service of God and neighbor when we could just as easily devote those very things to getting ahead in the world? We're all prone to such thoughts. But we must ask ourselves, whom do we think we're fooling? Which I think is basically the point that Paul was making to the Christians in Corinth. In not so subtle terms, Paul reminded them and us that when the church has been at its very best, it has appeared foolish. When the church has been at its best, it has pursued a path of discipleship and service in the world, which has led to rejection and ridicule, persecution, and even death, not praise and pats on the back from the culture. And yet the elect of God have gazed upon such so-called foolishness and have beheld the wisdom and glory of God. It takes a fool to follow the Lord. Indeed, the word Cretan, which today is an insult used to refer to someone we deem unintelligent, actually comes to us from the French word for Christian. Think about that. What the world considers to be an insult is what people of faith wear as a badge of honor. The annals of church history are filled with such people. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses who were just such people. Or to put it another way, we are surrounded by fools because it takes a fool 
at least from the world's perspective, to follow the Lord. It takes a fool to stand out, to stand apart, to bear witness to the reign of God. It takes a fool to kneel at the feet of others in service to them. It takes a fool not only to feed the hungry and clothe the naked and embrace the lonely, but also to confront the very structures and institutions responsible for such conditions in the first place. It takes a fool to exhibit the reconciling love and grace of God. So I ask you, when looking at us, does the world call us fools? Or have we fooled them and ourselves to the point that we completely blend in with the culture around us? To God be all the honor, glory, and praise forever. Amen. I want to ask now at this time that you would please stand and confirm what it is. I want to ask now at this time that you would please join me and confirm what it is we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed that can be found in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now return to God our thanksgiving through our tithes and our offerings which will be made again electronically this week by heading to our website, www.centralprespb.com. Look for the Donate Now link at the top of the webpage, <clears throat> and you can make your tithe with um, a uh, debit or credit card. If you prefer, you can also mail a check or money order to our church directly. The address is 6300 Trinity Drive, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, 71603. It is right and our greatest joy to give you thanks, eternal God, for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. But we are most grateful for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and for your abiding and sustaining Holy Spirit. For the Lord reconciled us to you and to one another, opening the door to eternal life. Your Holy Spirit continues to confront us, convict us, correct us, and equip us to enter the world and share the good news of your redeeming grace. And so, O oh God, we offer up our time, our talents, our treasures, and indeed our very selves for you to use as you see fit. Until that most glorious day when, at the name of Jesus, every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth shall bend, and every tongue shall confess him, Lord, to your honor and glory. Amen. At this time, let us share our joys and concerns, which there are several. Um, we want to continue to keep Dominic Munn in our prayers. Uh, his uh, leg surgery is scheduled for March 22nd. Uh, we want to continue to pray for the staff and the doctors and uh, uh, and the entire Munn family as they prepare Dominic for that surgery. Um, then there was um, also prayer asked for uh, Dalen Burnett, uh, 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 the family of Dalen Burnett. Uh, uh, Mr. Burnett was the 15-year-old uh, who was uh, shot and killed at Watson Chapel Junior High School this week. Um, our prayers go out to his family and to all the faculty, staff, and students uh, of the Watson Chapel School District uh, at this um, very, very sad and tragic time. Um, we also want to continue to pray for the uh, quick um, dispersion of the uh, COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, pray that for those who are opening up their, um, uh, their businesses and their um, and their um, shops and stores uh, that we uh, go ahead and um, we pray that that COVID-19 does not uh, spread more quickly, that the, um, that the variants uh, uh, do not uh, become prevalent in our country, uh, and that we uh, continue to uh, 
pray for the health of our frontline workers, our retail workers, our um, our first responders, our nurses, our doctors, our police and fire. Um, uh, we pray for all of those who are uh, who are yet to get the vaccine, and we pray for uh, everyone to get it as soon as possible. Um, we also want to continue to pray for uh, the reconciliation of our world to the Lord's will. Um, as uh, I know, it feels like uh, we're getting close to the end of this pandemic. We can see the light at the end of the tunnel, but we must stay vigilant in the coming weeks and days. Uh, let us pray. Holy and gracious Father, we give you thanks that the Lord Jesus Christ is in fact the same today as he was yesterday and will be for all of our tomorrows. Please be with Dominic. Uh, please be with Haley and Brad as they all deal with their medical conditions. Uh, please be with the students, the faculty and staff and the family of Dale and Burnett and uh, the Watson Chapel School District during this tragic time. Uh, also be with the family of the of the child who shot Mr. Burnett. Uh, this is a tragedy for everyone involved, and we we want you to be with them and comfort them in this time of loss, in this time of 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 anger and of upset. Uh, please be with those who are distributing the COVID nineteen vaccines. Uh, please be with those who are opening up their businesses. Uh, please prevent the continued spread of new variants in the world. Uh, please be with those, uh, <clears throat> those fire retail workers, the police and doctors and nurses who are dealing with the spread of this disease. Please protect them and, and put a hedge of protection over them. And um, please continue to uh, guide our country and our world to your will. Give us hope as we strive to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, who, pro who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now go out into the world in peace to love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power and the presence of God's Holy Spirit, taking today's message with you and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.